Hey everybody, and welcome to what I think is probably the last video we're going to do on electrochemistry uh, all together. And what we're going to focus in on in this video is this stuff here, aqueous electrolysis. So at this point, when it comes to electrolysis problems, and remember, electrolysis means that we're passing the current through the chemistry. So the chemistry may not be spontaneous. It's not supplying the voltage for us we're bringing the voltage to get some chemistry to happen. And so what we've looked at are simple electrolysis problems where you know what's going to happen and you have to do the stoichiometric calculation. We've looked at a problem where you don't necessarily know what's going to happen. You have to kind of figure out the chemistry first, then you can do the analysis. And lastly, we're going to take a look at a variant of that second kind of problem where you don't necessarily know what's going to happen initially. You have to figure out what chemistry is going to occur. And one of the options that could be happening is, since we're going to include water in the system, water itself could be um, one of the reagents involved in the electrolysis. Now, you could do this for yourself at home. You might want to be a little careful about how you do it, and I will make some links to some YouTube videos that show this being done. But you can actually take something like a 9-volt battery, right? A 9-volt battery is one of these batteries with the two little prongs at the top, right? A 9-volt battery. And if you connect it correctly with a little bit of basic engineering, you can actually uh, see the splitting of water into hydrogen and oxygen gas for yourself. Um, so, And that's an electrolysis problem. The hydrogen of H2O is getting reduced to hydrogen gas and the oxygen of H2O is getting oxidized up to um, a, a elemental oxygen, O2. So let's take a look at what happens when we start to consider the electrolysis being done when water is floating around in the system. So before we start putting anything into the water, let's just look at water itself. Water is electrochemically active. You can oxidize and reduce water. So here in the first little calculation I'll show you, excuse me, um, is the chemistry behind uh, the electrolysis of water itself. So here's the reaction of water getting split into its elemental constituents. So if you electrocute water, you will form oxygen gas and hydrogen gas. So the H plus 1 is getting reduced to hydrogen 0, and the O minus 2 is getting oxidized to elemental oxygen. Right? Now it turns out that this is a non-spontaneous process, and that's a good thing, right? If water spontaneously split up into hydrogen and oxygen gases, none of us would be here and the planet would be a big ball of fire, right? So it's good that water doesn't spontaneously split up. But this could also be um, the source of fuel, right? We saw with fuel cells that if we can get hydrogen and do the combustion with oxygen to make water, we could actually get energy out of that. So um, splitting water could be a way to getting hydrogen gas, which you could go and use later as a fuel. It's not a particularly efficient way to go about doing it, but you could do it. Nonetheless, let's focus in on the electrochemistry here. So the anode reaction, the oxidation, that's going on with water is here, where we're taking water and we're going to oxidize specifically the oxygen of water to elemental oxygen. Now, what happens to the hydrogen after you oxidize the oxygen? Well, it just floats around as H+. So you've done nothing electrochemically speaking to the hydrogen as you go from H plus 1 in water to H plus 1 as free hydrogen ions. What you've done in the anode compartment is you've made it acidic. You could actually test that as you do the splitting of water. You could see in the anode area that it becomes more acidic. Now, according to standard potentials, this goes off with negative 1.23 volts. The reduction of water would be, specifically speaking, the reduction of hydrogen would get reduced down to elemental hydrogen, H2, with zero oxidation state. And the oxygen that's uh, left behind actually uh, stays with one of the other hydrogens. So we have two hydrogens here. Kind of one of them gets reduced, and the other one doesn't, and it forms hydroxide. So in the cathode compartment, when you are electrochemically splitting water, in the cathode region, you'll see it becomes more basic. Okay? So the pH is um, 
is going to be rising in the cathode compartment and it's going to be falling in the anode compartment. All right, anyways, the cathode half reaction has a standard potential of negative 0.83 volts. Add these two together and you see that you've got the non-spontaneous negative two plus volts for the splitting of water. So you can't use a double A battery to try to split water because that doesn't bring enough voltage to the party. You've got to use something like a nine volt battery typically. Now, this is actually making an assumption about the concentrations and pressures up here. We're assuming that our oxygen and hydrogen gases here are being produced at one ATM. That's a reasonable assumption. We're also assuming that the hydrogen ions and the hydroxide ions are present at one molar, right? Because we're using standard uh, potentials. So real water doesn't have hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. Um, at one molar. Real water has them at much lower concentrations. So let's take a look at this chemistry again and see what it would be like for actual water. So I'm going to shrink this guy down a little bit, but I'm not going to shrink it down entirely because I want to still be able to refer to it. So let's keep those reactions in mind as we take a closer look at what happens in actual water. In real water, the H plus and the OH minus aren't there at one, eight, uh, uh, excuse me, one molar. They're present there at 10 to the minus seven molar. Remember the KW for water, right? KW is uh, 10 to the minus 14, which tells us the H plus and the OH minus concentrations both equal to each other, as we see here, and specifically they're equal to 10 to the minus seven molar. So what I'm going to do to the anode reaction is I'm going to correct it for the right concentration. So I'm going to apply the Nernst equation to that oxidation of water. And when I do, I have my Nernst equation here. The actual cell potential, E, will be equal to the standard potential, negative 1.23 volts, minus the correction factor. And since we're going to limit ourselves to 25 degrees, I'm using the simpler version of the correction factor just because I'm lazy and I don't want to write it all out. So anyways, that uh, simpler version has the value 0.0592 divided by the moles of electrons. And you see here we have four moles of electrons in that anode reaction times the log base 10 of the concentration of the products, which is going to be H plus here, which is 10 to the minus 7, times the pressure of oxygen, but we're going to say we're at 1 atm, so that's there, it's just there as 1 atm, all divided by the pure liquid water, and we know liquids go in as unity, as 1, into the mass action expression. So applying the Nernst equation to this half reaction using real concentrations, we get negative 0.82 volts. Cathode reaction, similarly applying the Nernst equation there. Standard potential, electrons, concentration of OH minus, the concentration of H2 is also there at 1 atm, divided by the 1 for the liquid water, and we get negative 0.42 volts. So if we combine these two half reactions, we'll actually see that the uh, voltage to split water under typical conditions is about 1.24-ish, 1.23-ish uh, uh, non-spontaneous volts. Okay, But in order to split water, what you have to do is you can't just pass a current through it, you have to make it be able to carry that current. So if you try this experiment where you take a 9 volt battery um, and connect some leads to it and try to split water on your own, um, you're actually going to have to put some salt into that water to make it um, a, a little bit more conductive. Alright, so that's the basic chemistry, no pun intended, of uh, electrocuting water itself. But chemically speaking, that's not what we're going to do. We're not going to just sit there and try to split water. What we're really going to be trying to do is do some electrolysis on aqueous salt solutions and see what happens there. So now I'm going to shrink these guys down because I want to get them out of the way. And I'm going to bring in a real world example here. If I can expand this, come on, get bigger. There we go. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to consider everybody's favorite salt being dissolved in water, sodium chloride. So I have aqueous sodium chloride. Now this is where we have to figure out what we have in the system, what could be possible electrochemically before we can actually identify what's going to occur. So if I have one molar sodium chloride, what I really have floating around in that beaker of salty water is one molar sodium ions, one molar chloride ions, we have 10 to the minus seven molar H plus, 10 to the minus 7 
uh, molar hydroxide, and of course we have lots and lots of liquid water. So these are the five species, the five chemical species, that are floating around in my bucket of one molar sodium chloride. The question becomes, what can happen electrochemically to these things? What can be reduced and what would be formed? What could be oxidized and what could be formed? And then we can figure out, at least theoretically, what, sh what chemistry we should see happening at each electrode. So let's take a close look. All right, so let's start with, actually, let's start with some chemistry common sense, okay? Which of these species could be reduced? Can you reduce chloride anions? In other words, can you continue to add electron density to a chloride anion? Probably not, right? It's already negatively charged, so trying to reduce chloride anions further seems kind of hard to do. Same with hydroxide, right? It's already got a negative charge, so trying to reduce it even more probably isn't going to work. But we could reduce cations, and we can probably reduce neutral species. So let's bring in our possible reductions. So here are the three reactions that could happen in the cathode compartment in the reduction. I could reduce I could reduce Na plus to sodium, I can reduce H plus to hydrogen gas, and I can reduce water to hydrogen gas and hydroxide. That's the same half reaction for water that we saw before when we were talking just about water. Now, the numbers for these three possibilities. Sodium ions are present in our system as we set it up at one molar. So this half reaction is entirely standard conditions. So the cell potential for that reduction would be the same cell potential I would read off of my potential chart. And I don't seem to have one lying around here, but it's E0, read it right off the chart, be negative 2.71 volts. The reduction for the hydrogen ion, now this half reaction does involve non-standard conditions. Specifically, the H plus is only present at 10 to the minus 7 molar. So in order to calculate the cell potential of this half reaction, I have to apply the Nernst equation. Now, I'm not showing that here. I'm just showing you the result. But you should try this on your own and make sure you can get the same number, or at least darn close to the same number that I do. So if we apply the Nernst equation and use 1 atm for the pressure of hydrogen gas, you should get a value of negative 0.414 volts. Similarly, we could reduce water, right? We saw the reduction of water again up here. So the reduction of water to also form hydrogen gas. Apply the Nernst equation because hydroxide is present at only 10 to the minus 7. We should get negative 0.416 volts, okay? All right. Now, so those are my possibilities in the cathode compartment. How about my possibilities in the anode compartment? Let me bring in the oxidations over here. So I'm going to just try to make a little space here. This is getting a little busy, but I want to leave everything up here at once. So my possible oxidations. I could oxidize the anions and the neutral species. I could oxidize, I could oxidize the chloride to chlorine, the hydroxide to oxygen and water, and water to oxygen and hydrogen ions. This last half reaction is the same half reaction we saw up here. The oxidation of hydroxide, I figured out what that reaction was by looking on my potential chart. I found that hydroxide can be oxidized to oxygen, gas, and water. So we need to calculate these cell potentials. The chloride oxidation, there is nothing that's not standard about this. I can get this half reaction cell potential right off of the chart, the E0 value of negative 1.36 volts. The hydroxide oxidation, there are non-standard aspects to this. Again, the hydroxide is present only at 10 to the minus 7 molar. So I have to apply the Nernst equation to this half reaction. And when I do, I get negative 0.814 volts. Lastly, the oxidation of water, right? If I oxidize water, I form oxygen gas and hydrogen ions. I do need to Nernstify this half reaction as well because the H plus, again, is 10 to the minus 7. Use 1 atm for your oxygen pressures here when you apply the Nernst equation. Use 1 for water because it's a liquid. And when you Nernstify that, you get negative 0.816 volts. So now, the question becomes, what chemistry will I see at the two um, at the two electrodes. At the cathode, I want to pick in both cases, the cathode and the anode, I want to pick the one that is most thermodynamically favorable. So, 
What's more favorable? Negative 2.71, negative 0.414, or negative 0.416? Well, the numbers would tell us that this guy is more thermodynamically favorable. How about in the uh, anode compartment, the oxidation? What's more thermodynamically favorable? Negative 1.36, negative 8.14, or negative 8.16? Well, the numbers again would tell us that this middle guy here is more thermodynamically favorable. Nothing's thermodynamically favorable, right? Everything is non-spontaneous. But the least non-spontaneous options are the two that I circled there. Now, let's take a closer look at these two half reactions. Over in the reduction compartment here, in the cathode, both of these values are very, very close to each other. Very close to each other. And you see that they both are taking H positive 1, H positive 1 in water, and they're both forming hydrogen gas. So they're doing electrochemically very similar things. So it's no coincidence that their cell potentials, once we correct them with the Nernst equation, are very, very similar. They should be similar because they're doing electrochemically almost the exact same thing. So the question then becomes, what's really the reagent in the anode compartment, or excuse me, in the cathode compartment? Is the thing that we're actually reducing, are we really reducing H plus, or are we really reducing water? Use some common sense here. So that electrode is submerged in the anode, or excuse me, cathode compartment. What is more prevalent, H plus or water? Well, water, right? Water's everywhere in this system. So the material that's really forming the hydrogen gas is probably the water, because there's way more water in the system that can, to a you know, very similar extent, be uh, electrolyzed as hydrogen ions. Also, in the anode compartment, we've got the same setup, right? In both of these cases, we're doing the same kind of chemistry. We're trying to oxidize an oxygen up to elemental oxygen. Same electrochemical thing, and we have very similar values, and so correspondingly, you, we would expect, because there's way more water than there is hydroxide, that we would see um, that my source of oxygen gas is probably actually water. But the bottom line is this. When we do this kind of analysis, we're going to answer it thermodynamically speaking. Okay? What is the most thermodynamically favorable outcome? And in the cathode compartment, thermodynamically speaking, we should expect to see the production of hydrogen gas. Look, one way or the other, we're going to make hydrogen gas. And in the anode compartment, thermodynamically speaking, that's how we're going to answer these questions. I should see one way or the other, right, the production of oxygen gas. So that's the most complicated level of these problems. You have a salt with ions that itself could be uh, oxidized and reduced. And you also have water floating around, which itself could be oxidized and reduced. And so you need to list the possibilities, then go through the Nernst analysis where appropriate, and thermodynamically conclude which is most likely to occur. All right? So that's electrolysis, aqueous electrolysis, all wrapped up um, in now a, about an 18 and a half minute video for you. And that wraps up uh, pretty much everything uh, with electrochemistry. So we'll have some review materials for you in class. Um, and so uh, at this point, we're getting darn close uh, to being able to uh, assess the whole electrochemistry unit. So that's all for now. And uh, we'll see you next time. And next time will probably be uh, some organic chemistry coming up next.